Welcome to Emergency First. We're so glad you're here. Thanks for watching this week's message. If you would like more information about Marinci First, such as service times or ministry opportunities, feel free to check out facebook.com backslash Marinci AG or Marinci First at youtube.com. And two great ways to stay connected throughout the week is by hitting the subscribe button on our YouTube page. That way you'll be notified when something new is posted and by hitting like on our Facebook page. Thanks again for joining us today. Welcome home. I'm loving this series about the final trek and talking about if this was my last journey, if this was my last moment, have I loved enough? Have I reached out enough? Have I surrendered enough? Have I written that note that I should have wrote? Have I called those who I should have called? Today we're going to look at a, a very passionate Bible story and man, I could read half of Genesis to you with it, but... It's about a, a, a man that has an encounter with God, and, and, and that encounter with God changes everything. And, and that's the point and the hope that one moment th with God changes everything. That God changes everything. No matter what you're going through, no matter where you're at, no matter the hurt or the pain or the struggle or the strife, God changes everything. He makes the difference. He doesn't always take the bad situations and, and totally make them rosy, but he takes the heart and he gives it peace that passes understanding. He gives it a joy that never ends. And there's something about that encounter with the master. And, and today we're going to take it a step farther and talk about a, a cynic slow erosion because our world has a opportunity or it takes its opportunity to make us all cynics. And the dream that God has placed in our heart, the dream that God has given us, normally it's not shattered overnight. Normally it's a slow erosion of bitterness and trouble and trial that just kind of sucks the faith out of you or sucks the joy out of you or sucks whatever out of you. And you, you start out so excited for what God is doing and the next thing you know you're despondent. It's a part of life. To have their joy. So I want you to turn with me to Genesis 37. We're going to look at Joseph a little bit today. That's the best sermon I've ever heard. I'll tell you what. Philip and Donna weren't able to be here the last couple of weeks. And we've missed them and those babies. We're glad you guys are back tell you what all right genesis 37 verse number two says this joseph being 17 and i want you to highlight that 17 years old was pastoring the flock with his brothers he was a boy with the sons of beliah and Zavam, his father's wives and joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of the other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, are you indeed going to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? 
So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream. And this time he didn't use wisdom. He told him again. And he told it to his brothers. Behold, I have another dream. Behold the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowing down to me. What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come and bow down to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept this saying in mind. Go ahead, Miss Dolores. Génesis del 2 al 12, 37 del 2 al 12. Esta es la historia de la familia de Jacob. José, siendo de edad de 17 años, apacentaba las ovejas con sus hermanos, y el joven estaba con los hijos de Bila y con los hijos de Silpa, mujeres de su padre, e informaba a José a su padre la, fama, la mala fama de ellos. Y amaba a Israel a José, más que a todos sus hijos, porque lo había tenido en su vejez y le hizo una túnica de diversos colores. Y viendo sus hermanos que su padre lo amaba más que a todos sus hermanos, le aborrecían y no podían hablarle pacíficamente. Y soñó José un sueño y lo contó a sus hermanos y ellos llegaron a aborrecerle más todavía. Y él les dijo, oíd ahora este sueño que he soñado. He aquí que estábamos que atábamos manojos en medio del campo, y he aquí que mi manojo se levantaba y estaba derecho, y que vuestros manojos estaban alrededor y se inclinaban al mío. Le respondieron sus hermanos, ¿reinarás tú sobre nosotros, o señorearás sobre nosotros? Y le aborrecieron aún más, a causa de sus sueños y sus palabras. Soñó aún otro sueño, y lo contó a sus hermanos, diciendo, He aquí que he soñado otro sueño, y he aquí que el sol y la luna y once estrellas se inclinaban a mí. Y lo contó a su padre y a sus hermanos. Y su padre le reprendió y le dijo, ¿Qué sueño es este que soñaste? ¿Acaso vendremos yo y tu madre y tus hermanos a postrarnos en tierra ante ti? Y sus hermanos le tenían envidia, mas su padre meditaba en esto. Después fueron sus hermanos a apacentar las ovejas de su padre en Siquem. Amén. Amén. Father, bless your word today. Lord, I pray that I will preach to the one who has authority with the demonstration of your power. Let your signs and wonders follow us all the days of our life. Let your anointing continue to move through the house. Don't let anything I say or do that doesn't bring you glory. Lord, plant your word so deep in our hearts that it springs life. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people say, amen, amen. 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 Uh, I can't tell you how hard of a time I had this week putting together my thoughts and putting into words what I thought the Lord was speaking to us. It's been a rough week. And I, I don't know about you, but it's so irritating to me when someone makes a decision without any thought of how it affects others to change your course. There are so many times in life that it feels like life happens to us. And, you know, I have to admit that there are times that it's almost like you're watching from a hourglass or through a window someone else's life. Because life just seems to kind of like happen to you and around you and, and has nothing to always do with you. And because of that, I, I really believe that, you know, life has a way of making you a cynic. Always looking for the, the negative and people and things and ideas and, but most importantly, losing that connection, losing oneself, losing what God has placed in us. I, I believe that God has put a dream in every one of us. And, and he's breathed life into every one of us. And, and when I say a dream, I, I don't mean that you may want to be a Hollywood elite. I mean, you may be. I don't know. But probably not. When I think of dreams, I, I think of somebody that 
that, you know, wants to love their family well, that wants to contribute to people, that wants to contribute to the world, that wants to be the best you you can be. When I think about dreams, I think about, hey, wait a minute, I I want to pour myself in honor to God and all the other stuff. And the thing is, is that, you know, dreams can be shattered instantly by a blunder or a loss or some kind of tragedy. But let's be honest, most of the time, our dreams kind of fade with a slow erosion of life. Hope fades with a slow erosion of life. We sporadically remember what God has done in our lives. We sporadically remember the joy that we had, but it's quickly fleeting moments. And it seems like the the more that we walk in life, the more bitterness we seem to come in contact with. and, And the more that the negativity and all the other stuff just seems to kind of suck the joy right out of us. You know, it's a slow erosion. You know, I think about it all the time. You know, the steady drip of life, the steady drip of discouragement and negative comments and negative news and negative mind thoughts. But what do you do? You know, as I was watching Russia invade Ukraine this week, I had the thought that ran through my mind. What do you do when you get the raw end of the stick? You know, what what do you do when things don't turn out the way that you wanted them to? What do you do when life isn't fair? What, what do you do when you're Ukraine and you're minding your own business and you have a dream for freedom and all you want to do is love your kids and see your grandkids and all you want to do is live in peace and with no regard to you, no regard to how you feel, no regard to how you think, no regard to you whatsoever, another country or some disease or some tragedy or somebody's disloyal or, or something rips your heart out and invades your personal space. What do you do when you're Ukraine and you're just trying to live your life honoring to God and something invades your space? And sucks that joy and that peace and the happiness that God is trying to pour into you. And the bitterness begins to overwhelm you. I know there's nobody here that can relate to any of that. I wondered. You know, I I thought about it. You know, the unfairness of it. You know... When the bully bigger than you wants to invade your space. When a giant wants to breathe down your neck. When life seems to take a course that you you don't know how to fix. And it seems like everything's happening to you and on top of you. And you seem passive in your own life. You know, three steps forward, two steps back, and the carpet gets pulled out. And and you're walking through the maze of it, and yet you're, you're told by God, hey, wait a minute, you're still supposed to have joy in the bitterness. You're supposed to have peace in the storm. You're, you're, you're supposed to rise above it. You're, you're supposed to, you know, be different. You're supposed to have light in the house. How do you stand over the the grave of a loved one when the the death has sucked every ounce of your being out and still declare God is good? How do you make it through that tragedy? How do you stand up and not only proclaim it, but believe it that God is good? How, How can you stand in the midst of the greatest hurt and pain and betrayal and 
How can you sit in your bunker and watch your children cry and know there's nothing on planet earth you can do about it? Because everything is happening to you. And in the midst of it, with all of the hopelessness and frustration and anger and bitterness and thoughts that, hey, wait a minute, I don't deserve this. Then there's this this nudge in our spirit that says, hey, wait a minute, I've called you for more than this. And there's a light that's inside of you that is going out because your joy and your peace and everything I'm putting in you is being sucked out little by little with a slow erosion. The bottom line is that I believe we're all becoming cynical. It's very easy to see the doom and the gloom and the brokenness. It's very easy to to wonder, okay, God, have you actually abandoned us now? And then we come to our story here, our biblical story that's an amazing event where this boy, a 17-year-old boy, his only crime was that God called him to save the world. Here's this 17-year-old boy, innocent. Yeah, maybe he was a little haunty because he enjoyed his father's affections. But he's a 17-year-old boy. And his only crime is that the anointing of God was on him. And God said, hey, wait a minute. You're going to walk through hell because I'm going to take you from the dungeon to the palace. It's an amazing story if you think about it. It's an amazing journey. It's an amazing life. Because here's Joseph. God calls him and anoints him and says, Hey, basically I'm going to save the world to you. Now he didn't fully understand that, of course. But the more God was upon his life, the more his family hated him. That doesn't seem like our world today, does it? But the more God was on his life, the more his family hated him. So then you get Joseph, he's sold into slavery, taken to a foreign country, bought by these rich people, doing a good job. He's like, all right, you know, God is, God's actually with me. And he gets elevated, and then all of a sudden, someone lies about him, backstabs him, cheats him. He gets to roll into the stick, and he gets thrown into prison. And then all of a sudden, he, he starts getting elevated again. All right, God, God's, God's redeeming this. God, oh, thank you. Finally, God, finally. And then he gets forgotten about. <clears throat> it's an amazing story. It's a reminder to us that, you know, sometimes what you think of is another fire is actually God's way to prepare you for the palace. We don't like to think that way. But listen, you know, sometimes we're not ready for the palace until we walk through the fire. You know, God doesn't cause our pain, but God uses us. To shape us into the person he wants us to be. A person good enough to be in the palace. But there's an amazing part of this. We didn't read it because man Joseph's story runs forever. But there's an amazing part in Genesis 50. And we're going to jump to that right now. It's at the middle almost end of Joseph's life. He's surrounded by his brothers that betrayed him and and his father just dies and his brothers begin to panic because they're like dad is dead joseph's going to kill us because we deserve it and there's this amazing moment there where joseph has another encounter with god he has a god moment that changes everything it changes everything 
I don't know when the light bulb went off. I don't know when the encounter happens, but we know that it happened because he, Joseph is standing there and he runs to them and he makes this amazing declaration and I want to read it to you. Genesis 50, verse number 19. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? But listen to this. As for you, what you meant as evil against me, God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he said this. What you meant for evil, God has used for my good. But you meant to destroy me with. What you meant to take my joy away with. What you meant to take my life from me. What you meant to put me under your feet, devil. I'm here to tell you, God has flipped the script. God has changed it. What you meant for my destruction, God has made it for my good. And not only my good, but I'm going to take care of it all. This epiphany happens. This change moment. This encounter with God that changes everything. He goes from the dungeon to the palace. But then he has an understanding. Hey, wait a minute. I don't care what the devil has thrown at me. My God's had it from the beginning. My God has been in charge of this thing from the beginning. And I don't care what it looks like now. Looking in the rear view mirror, I wouldn't change a thing. It's an amazing moment. A moment where an encounter with God changes life. Because we're on a, a trajectory here in the world that we live in. To be pulled more and more cynical. To be pulled more and more bitter. To be having our joy and peace in every part of our being sucked right out of us. And just like Joseph, sometimes you're not the cause of your prison sentence. And we, we begin to walk through this life. Hey, wait a minute. God has breathed a dream over me. I thought my life was worth more than this. Look, I just want to love my family. I just want to live an ethical life. I just want to be a good person. And every time I turn around, there's a giant there that try to chase me out of town. He either didn't like that or liked it a lot. I don't know. <laughs> Trust it. You know, it just sucks the life. And then we come to, to Joseph, and Joseph reminds us that, hey, even in the midst of the prison sentence, even in the midst of the journey, even in the midst of the storm, even in the midst of COVID, even in the midst of war, even in the midst of bombardment, there's still a dream that's alive because God has never stepped off the throne and he's holding out hope for us to grab a hold of. That there's a peace, that there's a joy. You see, the one thing about Joseph was is that he never forgot the dream. And the problem with you and I is, is we keep letting the world steal the dream that God has put inside of us. Hey, wait a minute. This is not my home. I'm looking for one to come. My blessed hope is this world is bad, but that's going to make it right again. If you've been sold the bell of goods that this world is peachy and everything is good, I'm sorry, someone lied to you. This world is hurts and falls of thistles. But the joy and hope of heaven is that God's going to take what is broken and make it right again. There's a hope of which we live with. 
of which we carry. Joseph said, hey, wait, what you meant for my destruction? Devil, the lies that you're telling about me. Devil, the, the things that you're saying. Devil, the things that you're trying to break me down with. What you're meaning for my destruction. God is turning it for my good. Because all things work together for good for those that love him. And I'm going to stand for the truth. Because I have a dream inside me that won't let me quit. Because I know that my God has already overcome this. And I'm not living for the here and now. I'm living for my future home. Because I'm just passing through right now. And I'm not going to let you tuck my legs out from underneath me. Because I know that greater is he that's in me than the liar I'm looking at yeah. the peace so what do you do Joseph's story tells us four things and I want to look at them how do you stay honorable through the storm because here's where we are at church like it or like it you're in the storm and if you're waiting for the rainbow to come out, it's probably not happening. I think we're at the end of the end. I don't think anybody here heard me. I said, I think we're at the end of the end. And if you're waiting for the rainbow to appear, it's probably not going to happen. So you have a choice to make. We can either declare that God is good even in the midst of the life that we're living right now because our hope is not in this world or we can become bitter and distraught and broken and we can live with all of the hurt that this world has to offer because if you want to suffer, it's got you covered. If you want to be broken, you can find someone to break you. Or we can rise above it. Because we're living in the storm. And we're going to have to answer the question, okay, what am I going to do? Am I going to find God worthy in it? And am I going to run my race? Am I going to give up and quit? Am I going to bemoan everything that has ever happened to me? Am I going to blame everyone else? Am I going to give up? Am I going to lay down and die? Or am I going to be victorious and I'm going to hear those words, well done, now good and faithful servant, because I'm going to pull myself up and I'm going to keep on the journey because I know that there's a hope inside of me, a dream that won't die. I've got to answer the question. Because things could get worse and never get better. That's sobering. I'm used to saying things normally get worse and they get better. But I believe we're at the end of the end. And things may get worse and never get better. And if that's the case, I'm going to have to make a stand. And I'm going to have to make my mind up. And I'm going to have to purpose inside myself what I'm going to do. Because if you wait to the moment comes when you're asked the question to stand, to make your mind up, you're not going to be able to stand. But if you purpose now, I'm going to be a purpose, a person of dreams and hopes. And I'm going to let God use me. And I will stand. So we're going to, let's look at four things. Number one, remember. That's what Joseph did. Our dreams tend to fade when we're tired, exhausted, unappreciated, overwhelmed, and the constant drip of brokenness. But what did Joseph do? Joseph remembered that during his darkest moments... God gave him a dream. And if God gave him a dream, God's going to bring that dream to pass. 
He remembered God's goodness. He remembered God's faithfulness. He remembered that even though I don't understand what is happening to me, I don't even understand the dream that he gave me and why would prison go along with it. But there was something inside of him that he kept remembering the dream that God gave him. He remembered that his God was faithful, that his God was good, and he kept repeating it over and over and over again. Listen to this dream that I have. Listen to this hope that I have. Listen to this joy that I have. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it and the world can't take it. He kept remembering. He kept moving over and over and over again. He may not have understood their implications, but he understood if God gave it, it would come to pass. And listen, you and I, we're in a far better position than Joseph ever was. Joseph had limited knowledge. We have the whole scripture that reminds us not only of God's goodness and grace, but of the unique ways that things happen. We have God's picture of grace and and how it always comes through. We have his word in front of us. So when we feel our heart drifting, what do we do? We go back and we start remembering the dream that God put inside of us. We start remembering. And look, I... Sometimes we start feeling entitled. We start feeling like, hey, wait a minute. I'm entitled to something better than this. But the bottom line is when you begin to think about it and remember that the one that we call Savior bled and died upon a rusted tree for you and I, that while we were yet sinners, Jesus still came and died. And we ask ourselves, hey, wait a minute. That's what he did for me. The one that I call Savior came and gave everything to redeem me from my life. And when I remember his love, and I remember his mercy, and I remember his grace, then how can I ever stop remembering who he is? And though I walk through this valley of the shadow of death, and though pandemics are on my doorstep, and who knows about World War III, it really doesn't matter. Because whether it's the prison cell or whether it's slavery, all we know is there's a dream inside my heart and I remember my promises. And I know that he has got this. I have to make my mind up. Joseph had this encounter with God. He says, hey, wait a minute. What you meant for my destruction... God's already used it for my good. So number one, remember. Number two, return. I was listening to the news about the Ukrainian attack and they are talking about planes and all that kind of thing. And it got me thinking, you know, when a, every day there are thousands of planes across the sky and before a pilot takes off, he gives a flight plan. And his goal is to stay as close to that flight plan as possible. But because of the wind and the drafts and everything, he's constantly being thrown off. But he's constantly making corrections. He's thrown off corrections. The entire flight is nothing but corrections. A return to the original flight plan. And it got me thinking about our spiritual walk and our spiritual life. Isn't that what it is? It's constant correction. Constantly making the corrections, getting back on course, getting back on the plan, getting back on the dream. Because there's a lot of winds out there trying to blow you off course. There's a lot of distractions and angst and things happening. But it's those constant corrections. And then you think of Jesus' words. You know, he's speaking to the church of Ephesus in Revelation and he says... Man, you've done a lot of right, but there's one thing you've done wrong. I hold this against you. You've, you've lost your first love. You left your first love. You've, you've got off course. And if you don't 
fix it. If you don't get it right, if you don't make a course adjustment here, it's going to bring you to a dead end. But if you make a course adjustment, my promise is, is those that live by faith will see me again. That's beautiful. That course adjustment that takes us from a broken heart, that takes us from brokenness, that takes us from a calloused heart, that takes us from the cynic back to believing again. Because if we let the world keep blowing us off course, we will get farther and farther from the dream. And we will become more and more the cynic. And we will lose all hope. We will lose all peace. Most importantly, we'll lose ourselves. Because the person that God has created us to be Instead of being that person, we will become a shell of our own selves. Have you ever looked at yourself in the mirror and say, I don't like what I see? And I'm not talking about your weight. I don't like that attitude. I don't like that I've stopped trusting people. I've, I don't like that I, I've become bitter. I don't like the cynicism that has filled my life. I don't like that I automatically jump to the negative and have to be dragged to the positive. I don't like that I've forgotten how to dream. I don't like that I've forgotten how to hope. I don't like that I've forgotten how to have peace. It's the course correction. That's what Joseph did. He remembered and then he returned constantly over and over and over again to where God was. Because every time he got thrown off course, he ran back as fast as he could. Because he knew apart from God, he could do nothing but with God, even in the prison cell. He still could accomplish his plan in him. Look, we, we live in a day and a time where we're going to have to say that apart from God, we can do nothing. But even in the midst of a pandemic and a war and whatever else, that with God, we still have everything. Because God is the giver of all. He is the giver of good things. He's the joy that we have. And though the world slay me, yet shall I praise him for he's still worthy. It's the course correction. The return, the return, the constant move back. Then number three, it's the repeat. I like the R's. <laughs> the repeat. You know, Joseph didn't waste his time with anger and blame and blaming everyone else he could have. But he rehearsed his dreams many times to make sure that his heart was not callous towards God. Over and over and over again. You know, there's one concept in the biblical text that repeats itself over and over and over again. Almost as if it thought we were hard-headed and wouldn't get it the first time. It might have been right. But a, a, a constant reminder over and over and over again that you take my word, you hide it in your heart, and you keep repeating it. You keep standing on it so that it becomes written upon your heart. You keep rehearsing it over and over and over again. You not only remember my promises, you not only return your course, but you've got to keep, keep, keep rehearsing my word. Amen. Constantly. Reminding yourself of my promises, constantly repeating it over and over and over again till it's so written upon your heart that it becomes who you are. So that it becomes your hope and your peace and your joy. See, when Joseph was in prison, all he had was a repeat of who God was. God is still good even though it's so cold. God is still good even though it's so broken. God is still good. I repeat constantly of who God was. A remembrance 
but a repeat. A repeat of who God is. And then it brings us to number four, our waiting. I couldn't find a four that, uh, R that would work there, so we're going to go to W. Three R's and a W. <laughs> Awaiting. You know, Joseph waited 20 years in darkness. And it's unreasonable to think that you and I won't have to wait for the fulfillment of the dream that God has given us as well. Waiting on the Lord. Listen, waiting on the Lord does not have anything to do with passively just sitting there until he shows up. Waiting isn't really about time at all. It's about an expectation. We long for God to move. We trust that what he said he will do, he will do. It's not laying down and dying, but it's an expectation that our God is faithful. And I'm going to wait, and his promise isn't going to draw cold and closed. Look, he may be slow in returning, but he's still coming. And I'm going to wait. And my God still shows up on the scene when I need him. That even though I'm walking through this valley, I'm waiting on the Lord. I have expectation that my God is still who he said he is. And nothing can remove it out of my hands. But most importantly, nothing can remove him or me out of his hands. You know, look, I, I, I honestly believe that when Joseph looked back at his life as an old man, he was satisfied with God's path for his dream. I honestly believe that when Joseph looked back over his life, he was satisfied. You know, in the middle of the disappointment and the delays, he kind of wondered what God was doing. But faith kept him through the tough times. And, and I believe that when he looked in the rearview mirror and he saw what was behind him, that's when he could raise his hands and say, it was worth it all. It was worth it all. I didn't understand the journey that I had to walk through to go from the prison to the palace. But when I look in the rearview mirror, I can see that my God was upon it, and my God was in it, and my God was with me, and he's kept me safe, and he's kept me whole, and he's kept me sane, and he's got me through, and he's taking care of me, and I made it to the finish line, and I'm not only here, but a great is my reward, and I'm not only here, but I'm going to take care of everyone you don't have to be afraid anymore i love it just say hey, wait a minute don't be fearful what you meant devil for my destruction god had that from the very beginning you just thought you were winning but you've been the fool all along because everything you threw at me, God had a backward plan knowing how he was going to work that out. You only thought I was your puppet. <laughs> the only real puppet here is you. When God says dance, you say how high is you're halfway in the air. Because I'm waiting on the Lord. And when I look in the rear view mirror, his goodness and his mercy, I don't always see it as I'm walking through it, but I, when I look in the rear view mirror and I'm waiting upon the Lord, I have the expectation. It's not a lay down and die, but it's a knowing that he is who he said he is. That he's good. That his mercy endures forever. You see, faith kept him going when times were tough. But it's holding on to his dream. It's, it's repeating the promises. It's standing firm and it's waiting. 
I know we don't, we like to live in the microwave. But it doesn't work for faith. I wish I could stand up here and say, I've shook the eight ball and it said everything will go back to normal tomorrow. Didn't work. I shook the eight ball and it said, hold on, brother, it's getting worse. <laughs> Got to hold on. You see, a, a cynic slow erosion. This is the month of love and we're talking about grabbing a hold of ourselves, becoming the person that God has called us to be. And God has never called us to be a cynic. He hasn't called us to live in a world that is always doom and gloom. He's called us to be the light to what is dark. And the only way we can be light to the dark is to have light inside of us. There has to be a joy inside of us that overcomes whatever is out there. There has to be a peace inside of us that overcomes whatever is out there. There has to be something inside of you that when you're standing next to your cellmate, he's like, hey, wait a minute, even in the chains you're happy. And that sounds crazy, but there's a joy inside of us. Because we know this world's not our home. And we know, come what may, God's got this. So I'm not going to be worried and fretful over what may come because I may see a jail cell, but I'm going to see my Jesus. And whatever may come, he's going to walk with us through it. But I'm not going to let the devil win. And I'm not going to live in a slow erosion of my life. I'm going to love more than I've ever loved. I'm going to hope more than I've ever hoped. I'm going to dream bigger than I've ever dreamed. And I'm going to walk in peace like I've never had it before. Because I'm going to see, because the bigger the problem, the more the anointing. So let's get up and move. Amen. And let God have this. The bigger your problem, the more your anointing. Don't give up. Don't live in the slow erosion. Don't live there. Lance, come and join me.